Where'd it go, Bob? Did you? It's on the. Oh, there it is. I can see it now. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> so uh, this this presentation looks like the project has come out of lots of conversations, really, hasn't it? So I think the presentation will probably be a bit of a of a conversation too. And um, we're going to introduce ourselves a bit in a minute. For those that's who we are, as you've just heard. We want to just kick off by asking you, what do you think when you think of the city of York? What comes into your mind? That's what we want to start with. Walls. Vikings. Vikings. <laughs> Massacre for the Jews. Yes. Good pubs. Good pubs. <laughs> Romans. Sorry, what was that? Romans. Romans. Picture of postcard now. Yeah. yeah. Chocolate. Chocolate, yeah. Fudge. Fudge. <laughs> Very good fudge shop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well on Petergate. Uh, just at the bottom of the shambles, I think. Okay. What do we make of that? <laughs> well, we've got a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> in it. Yes. And uh, in a little bit of context, you know, if you dig in your backyard, you can pull, pull up a bit of bone or Viking comb or Roman pottery. Everybody's done it. And, you know, it's just short of 2,000 years old, um, 170,000 people, 25 miles from Leeds, which is about 250 years old, with about a million people. It's this part of the world had huge dynamics in the growth of these cities. We've got about 5.5 million people within an hour of York, and most of them come to see the place. And we're also on the London, York, Edinburgh tourist axis. So we get about four, it's debatable because they inflate the figures between four and seven million people <laughs> a year. And they sell that history in a certain way that we've got to live with and also try to get any um, talk about the reality of that history through is quite difficult. So we're doing a bit, so a little bit different to what you lot are doing is that we seem to be taking on the city. <laughs> and um, it's a city that sells that history. I mean, I think practically it's a wall city and practically everything inside that wall city will be a listed building. So, um, York reminds me of that sexiest idea of the dumb blonde. It's very beautiful, but there's not much going on. Um, and not much going on is literally Vikings and Romans. And you try to get anything beyond that, um, it's very, very difficult. They have Viking festivals where everybody dresses up. They encourage lots of reenactment, which is dressing up and it never goes beyond that and only last week the uh, latest addition to the tourist offer was um, a Viking aftershave <laughs> called Norse Power <laughs> which the Yorvik group, which is the York Archaeological <laughs> Trust are selling at probably suitably Nordic prices as well so this is the problem that we have and the people come to York and the people that perceive this city and we're out to tell them that there's other things, not only other things, but there's a hell of a lot more to it. And we've tried to, we've seized a little bit, and um, it'll come out what we've been doing. Yeah, so that's why I want to start by asking you what you think of York, because in a way that's one of our issues. We're, we're trying to do a bit of cultural politics in the city, aren't we? So we're asking these questions. Uh, how are decisions about heritage made in York? How do these decisions affect the lives of people who live in York? And how can we increase kind of public participation, democratic participation in decision making about history and heritage? So that's basically what we're going to be talking about. But we want to just uh, tell a bit of the story about how we all got involved. Do you want to kick off? I'll go first. <laughs> I'm Richard. We run a small-ish Facebook group not called... Small. Well, not anymore, no. <laughs> <laughs> called York Past and Present. Uh, we wanted to get an archive of, of history together of York, but from the community, not from the archives York's already got. Because it's... To be honest, it isn't that good, the York Archives. So, we started this Facebook page about eight months ago, thinking we'd get around about 1,000 members. I think now we're pushing around about 4,500 members, 350, 400 a month now. A week. Uh, is it a week? A week. Well, there we go then. A week. It, it, it's growing massively. And, and the community we've got, it, I call it, it is a Facebook group, but it's not. It is more like a living, breathing, historical community. And we met Helen through that, and we, we've, we've done a lot of work through that, which you will explain. Yeah. But it, it really is, it's a fantastic place to be. Our archives are, are just brilliant. 
I mean, we've got so much video content and images. People share the memories, the stories. It's unlike anything that the City of York Council have. So, thank you. Um, as Richard just said, we met Helen through the Facebook group. Um, first of all, it started with the live drop-ins, where we were meeting, meeting Helen in the York Library. Um, we were supposed to be talking about the, 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 the Stoneboy Inquiry, which is basically, it's... It was that building there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the yeah, big yeah, there. Um, <laughs> So we've been doing, we're doing various things. I've that's been, Stoneboy. And basically what we wanted to do was get people's, people's opinions on what they thought of Stoneboy as a whole. We did an um, event in just... Well, it's a photo of children. There's actually a heron um, food shop, and we did a stall outside there. And we basically went and asked public what they thought of it. We had so many comments. One person said, "Blow the whole thing up." Um, another lady turned around and said that basically she's she's not interested about the stone boat as a whole. But what a lot of people's opinions were was the big top tower should be demolished because it doesn't get used. It is an eyesore, through a lot of people's opinions. But there are a lot of shops there as well. There are a lot of people's businesses there. So we were trying to come to terms with what to do with it, because the council have just bought it, and it's all up in the air at the moment. So yeah, we were doing the live drop-ins. Um, we did the Stoneway Inquiry, which was quite su successful. And then from there, of doing the live job, we did the um, York plaque day, which is, we went round with little blue plaques, which there, are, there is one on the table at the top. And we stuck the alternative history to York on there, in the various places. And then, as our Facebook group, we've now decided to kind of interact it as well, to try and get our Facebook members to come to um, picnics but she held every Sunday while it's, while it's summer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have got one this weekend, but obviously that'll depend on the weather. But yeah, so we're just trying to basically get members in, involved and interact with us as well. Yeah, so what we'll do um, a bit later on in the presentation, try and draw out the principles, like the things that we see as our tools. But Paul, do you want to just sort of say how you got involved as well? Yeah, well, none of us knew each other from about a year, year ago. It's, we've all met through um, finding a, a, this immense frustration with York, we live in there, and, and yeah. um, the history that we have to endure rather than <laughs> participate in or enjoy. And shall I say what I did? Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I, I do is um, every now and again I feel the need to organise a walk around York and I get various people and tell them to see lots and lots of things that just aren't part and parcel of it. And I, I'll, I'll just run through some of the places that take, you to, uh, take people to. And none of them are marked with anything. Well, there's only one usually that's marked, but they're all off the beaten track. And the one that is marked is um, uh, Dr. John Burton, who invented the obstetric forceps and got George Stubbs to, to draw the, um, the, the dissections of a pregnant woman in the 1780s. York has nothing to do with that. The, um, this one, I only saw this the other day, because I, I never look at... Um, I've got, I, I, those people look like they really enjoy themselves. I, I, was, know, I was really pleased true. with that, because I know I gave what people that. look like. But they tell telling this story of a bloke called Arthur Joseph Mumby, who was... Um, uh, he was a poet, hung around with the pre athletes and he was a bit of a sex pest to working-class women. He, he liked really dirty women, and by dirty I mean he got this... His servant uh, one called Hannah Colic to climb up chimneys before they had sex. <laughs> and, but what he actually did was he took photographs of working women uh, as a wank bag basically. And he, um, he's got photographs of women miners from the 19th century. And it's the only way we know what these women look like. So because of that. And York has, doesn't have them, but the Hepworth Gallery in Wakefield displays them. So, you know, ironically, this is, we have these images. Um, this? Are you going to the... Yeah, I was just thinking just to sort of say why this was so important to go and try and tell these kinds of stories about mm. York is it really comes back to 
to some of these kind of things about what your kids, all of you, helpfully provided for us at the beginning. So I think what we've pulled together these headlines to kind of kick off the project. You know, there's something about your aiming for a billion pound tourist economy. There's something about the fact there is poverty in York, and that's acknowledged, and the Joseph Rantry Foundation are quite famous for drawing attention to that. There's desire from the council leader to make York a tiger economy, outperforming every other economy in the north of England. Um, there's also the sense that York's lovely, voted the most beautiful historic by city. Daily Mail read this by Daily Mail read <laughs> <laughs> um, And it's one of the most expensive places in, in Britain to buy a house, and that the, particularly the affordability gap between average wage and the cost of living... Um, either in rented accommodation or buying a house, is one of the biggest in the country. So those were the kind of connections. And we had this kind of linkling that, in a way, heritage was in the middle of this mess. So that was partly what we are trying to get a hang handle on. So you have got this sense of York, ah, oh, it's so beautiful, it's so lovely, it's marketed. There's a certain sense of it being aestheticised. There's certainly a question of gentrification going on um, that we've been speaking a lot about. That's a, a tweet from James Alexander, the council leader, who's basically saying there's a real heritage, so they bang on about this tram shed that there was a whole issue about. But I think what was interesting for us about that was the sense there is a real heritage, and that's defined in quite a narrow way, the kinds of ways of Romans and Vikings and the set-aside sort of medieval city centre and things. So it's because of all of that. Um, and I think one of the other things we found through doing the project over the last four months, really, has been this massive disconnection between, on the one hand, the council really, I think, truly, genuinely believe they do a good job doing public consultation. It's also completely fair to say they are the only people who in the city would say that, yes. and that there is a strong sense from everyone we've spoken to, we've had lots of conversations, that it's they that make decisions somewhere else, and that there's no real way of holding them to account or participating into it. So I think yeah, there's a bit of a kind of cocktail of things we notice, really, which is like, these kind of senses of what York is, that's a lovely quote that Paul always mentions from Greg Dyke, who's Chancellor of York University, <laughs> he used to be Director General of the BBC, so he's saying York used to be a working class city. Um, so there's this kind of sense that, you know, there's a good desire to connect with people from the council, but they don't seem to really know how to do it. Um, but then there's a kind of sense from everyone else that they make decisions, and it's happening in a kind of place you can't possibly engage with. And so this has led us to, as Paul was describing, sort of trying to lift the lid off York, try and change the sense and the perception of what York is. <coughs> That's been a lot about what, what the walks have been about, isn't it? Yeah. So we talked a bit in preparing for this um, on a lovely sunny day, wasn't it? Uh, which seems like a long time ago, it's only last week. Um, <laughs> about what the tools we had to, to use to do this. And I think this takes us back to the kind of history itself, which is something you said, Paul, wasn't it? Um, and this is, a, this is a plaque from our Write Your Own Plaque Day. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, it, in this episode, we decided to take hold of that history and give, give it a good shake. And um, you don't have to, you, you know, you'll all know you don't have to scratch very far to uncover some real gems. And this, um, um, I'll just tell you who the two guys are, John Chesterman and Stuart Feather, they were both from York. Um, Stuart Feather is, uh, well, was the son of a, uh, his parents were a fish and chip shop in one of the suburbs, and he worked in a factory. But these two guys met, they were gay, when they were about 16, they met in a public toilet, which is probably this one. In 1954, I think it was, and um, it was Love Across the Urinals, and they, um, they lived together. And, and then they moved to London. Uh, th there's, a, there's a story, this is in pre-liberation <coughs> pre days, pre-equality. And um, um, bas basically, they, w they went to London and they got involved in, John Chesterman in particular, he got involved in the second meeting of Gay Liberation Front and he drafted up the Gay Liberation Front's list of demands. And um, both of them, in 1972, organised the very first gay pride demo, which was in Highbury Fields in London, of about 200 people, which now, of course, gets about a million people. So in one sense, it can all be related back to this gent in Europe, where these two guys, <laughs> these two kids, these two kids, because that's what they were, yeah. met. Um, it, you know, it was just completely legal for them to meet, and they did, and that was the end result. So 
Um, John Chesterman died in 1996, but Stuart Fellows, very old man, he's still alive in London. I have no idea, I was trying to track down, there's a, a book called Queer London, I found a reference to um, uh, John Chesterman in that, and I tried, it just said that he was from York, and I tried to track him down, it was very difficult to find anything about him, and um, because I was nervous, it, out of the blow, John Feather turned up, I had no idea that man existed, and got, there's a, the story's longer, but... I haven't got time, obviously, but this is quite important. But it's a, that is the kind of sense of, like, there are, there are these histories that yeah. just don't get a lot of play in York because of the greatest hits histories. And so it's about just taking that as an idea, the history itself being a political tool, in a way, that diversity of history, and doing something with it. So we had a fantastic day, didn't we, going around yeah. town, it sticking them up, and everyone suggested them, and lots of people from the Facebook group <coughs> and other groups suggested them and talked about why they're important. But then partly this comes back to something that... That Councillor Barb Boyce, who's become become you know really active on the Facebook yes. group, hasn't she? But she came on the first walk we ran in when was it February or something, like, yeah. and she was like getting a little bit frustrated with it. She's like saying, but not everything's a decision. It's not like there's always a committee of people around the table going, hmm, what should we do? Let's decide something. And part of the point was let's you know just go and do stuff. Yes. So I think that was part of our ethos anyway. But I think it's been quite an important mm. intervention. It basically, was a case of. You want, to, you want to do something, you want to change something, then get off your backside and do it. Don't don't sit there and moan about in your round chairs and and expect everybody to do it for you. Actually get in there and get your hands dirty and do something. And interestingly, these blue plaques, which are cardboard plaques and disposable, necessarily so, and when we put them up, I mean, that day it became torrential with rain later that day, but I walked around York the, the next day, and the ones you put up on Marks and Spencers, on the Orange Shop, on Starbucks were there. The only ones that disappeared were on buildings around by the York Museum's Trust. <laughs> we don't know what to make of that yet. <laughs> I think we do. I think we're <laughs> we should at least give them a chance to respond to that, shouldn't we? Well, yeah, let's come down. Um, well, not on the... Um, anyway, no, that's an yeah. internal <laughs> argument. Um, so, uh, the, other, the other tool we were thinking about that we've been using is seeing things through lots of different people's eyes and not assuming people aren't going to be interested. And that goes for professionals in these kind of institutions and also uh, politicians. So we've been having conversations with councillors, we've been having conversations, and we're hoping to bring people into dialogue, really. And that's one of the aims of it. We probably haven't got much time left, have we, Bob? Um. Five minutes. Oh, really? Okay. So I suppose just to slow down a little bit on that one, we've been using sort of lots and lots of one-to-one -one conversations, whether that's around the public stall we run outside Heron Foods, or with some of the regulars at the Yorbit Cafe, which are in that brutalist building we had a picture of. Um, and the aim of that is to slowly build the kinds of relationships that mean that we can create new kinds of public spaces for conversations, and ultimately, I, I think, for, for decision-making. So that's one thing we're working on around Stonebow, which we know a decision's coming about because the council has bought the freehold of the building with a view to making a decision. So we've, we're in a way trying to intervene now within something we know is coming. Um, and we're doing that in all sorts of ways. And those are the kind of me history menus we developed for, for the tables in the Orbit Cafe. Um, but a crucial thing, uh, one of our tools has been the Facebook group, hasn't it? So Richard, yeah, it, talk about that. it's... Facebook groups a big thing. It's it's grown massively in 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 the last few months. It, it really has, and there's such a wide variety of people mm. and of all age groups that has, have got such an interest. And every time we have an event of some sort, yeah. it does seem to attract more and more people. Mm. And the more and more people it attracts, the more and more the group seems to grow as a community. Mm. And and it is it is a brilliant tool to use to get, to get your ideas and your thoughts out there and, and, and try and change some of this this short-sighted opinion our council have. Yeah. And one thing you've always done about that, isn't it? It's like the, the danger of history in York stops at 300, 300 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Really. We're about 300 years of history missing. Yeah, yeah. and that's what the group's gone. about. It's about that. It's about memories and yeah. like photographs you might have got from your yeah, grandfather yeah. and your yeah. Yeah. And, but it's also become a place for actually talking about some of these questions about who yes. makes the decisions as well. And it's ended up being <coughs> kind of really crucial. It has. It's become a done. brilliant sounding board to yeah. bounce ideas off and um, get other people's thoughts, ideas, opinions. Yeah, we're doing an A to Z of the, um, of the <coughs> area around Clifford's Tower in, in York, um, which is where the kind of massacre of Jews happened in 1190. Um, 
So one of the things is to sort of see how we can yeah. create different kinds of, in a sense, public spaces and connect them together as part of a kind of more democratic and engaged decision-making process within the city. So <coughs> I guess we've spoken about this already, but I think this has been such an crucial ethos, hasn't it? I mean, we worked out we met on the 12th of February. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So everything we've done has happened since then, yeah. and a lot of it has been about trying to break down that sense of disconnection that we've noticed between the council thinking they're connecting but no one else agreeing, and, um, and but then also everyone else thinking it's they, anonymous people who they can't possibly speak to or influence in any way. So we're trying to break that down through creating spaces where those kind of interactions can happen. Mm. We don't know whether this is going to work yet, I should say, but we're hopeful. We've had um, good chats with city archaeologists about the potential, oh, that's actually the next slide. <laughs> um, so we're actually, so we're in, so we've been doing lots of stuff as well. It's been part of the, the whole DIY ethos of it, hasn't it? Yes. That's the Facebook group, whether it's making our own cardboard plaques and um, you know history menus and, and Paul's walks. Um, so in a sense, we've been creating energies outside of um, existing sort of museums and heritage structures and official mm. processes. But what we're really interested in is how we can connect the two together. How can the kind of history work we've been doing? Um, be connected into official processes and so we've got a few little potentials that we're trying to cultivate and one is a, with, in discussion with the city archaeologist about whether um, there could be a kind of for want of a better phrase he liked this phrase I think, citizen documentation yes. space within the planning process, so the idea is the building is going to be changed or going to be sold off, whatever's going to happen to it, that there might be a day where people can come in and take photographs yeah. Richard the big urban explorer aren't you so yes. using some of those sort of senses of actually we know a lot about this space and actually you might be okay about things changing yeah. about it but we want to be able to be in there to sort of know about it and share what we know and document it for the future as well because a lot of this is a lot of the city or council when they go into buildings they, they hire private firms to do their documentation and the private firms keep their images private they're not made to the general public and that's something as a group we wanted to change it, it, it's history. We wanted it to be shared as history yeah. and not not kept to private firms, mm. which is where this documentation comes in. We wanted to get in there and say, well, look, it's, it's our buildings, our history. We should all share this. We want it to be public. It's one of those ironic disconnects, is it? They yeah. now can't afford that. Yeah, and yeah. I suppose lots of people who want to do it. Yeah, so yeah, it's just yeah. Like trying it, it, to bridge yeah. that, these disconnections that sometimes just happen where you've got people in office going, hmm, I don't know how to c connect with the community. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all this yeah. stuff happening. So we're just trying to bridge some of those things at the moment. So uh, I reckon this is a free for all, really. So the question of legacy, we were talking about this, weren't we? How, so what, what were our thoughts about like, the idea of legacy? There's some, some debate about whether that felt like a right word for us. No. Well, as somebody who was born and bred in Wage, is that legacy there? That big bust of John Barrett, I mean that's his idea of legacy, but the reality is that it's very well known in Leeds, is he was a bloke who wouldn't give Jews jobs, you know, there he is in Marble. Yeah. What is legacy? Legacy is somebody else's always, there it's never that, the bulk of the people. There is that parallel with, heri with what we're yeah. contesting around heritage yes. there, isn't it? Is yeah. that what gets passed on, what gets seen as valuable to pass on? Um, so, in a way with thinking about, we're a bit, we're a bit ambitious, we want to change the whole city, yeah, so, um, so in a way we want change, we want kind of a more democratic culture in the city to be our, well, whatever, an ongoing lived thing, yes. um, but I suppose really more concretely, like, cool, it's something isn't it about a like, plural sense of what the city's past is, so we can think mm. open, in an open way about the future of the city. Mm. Um, and I think the concrete things we want to achieve around linking in sort of DIY action and passion and enthusiasm and knowledge within formal procedures, and we're trying to really push that. Um, I don't know, I think we were hearing about the market the other day, weren't we, Dan? About yeah, you yeah. get market. Yes. And Basi basically, um, <laughs> what they're doing is uh, revamping the York market. Now, it's been, I've not had a chance to do the research for today, but it's been there for many, many years. It, especially since I was a kid, my grandparents used to go on the market and pick up the apples and it is, it is been there for a long time. Now basically what they're trying to say is they don't want the cheap stalls on the market, they want to take the cheapness of York away from the city centre and put it on the outskirts the suburbs. and yes. bring in more, more expensive shops. Now, okay, yeah. that's fair enough. 
yes, we've got tourists that do come and shop in the, in the city centre, <coughs> but for those people that live in the city centre, why should they have to go outside of York to go and do their shopping, to pick up maybe a 94 of their mum or their ground, when you could get it off the market for eight quid? You go to work. You go to a shop on the on the suburbs. I think there was a, we heard yeah, spending think 16, 17 yeah, I think, pounds. Was, I think there was a classic quote by one of the councillors when he was asked, "Well, where are people going to buy cheap clothes?" And, and one of the councillors replied, "Well, they're building a Primark outside town." Mm. Which, well, it's which just sort of you know, it's like, like if you put get out of the city. Yeah. yeah. So um, and I think in a way this word of gentrification, which I mean it's been around for a long time, but actually. We're trying to remobilise it in the city at the moment. <laughs> and it manifests and sort of itself as it. fud shops and scented candles, yeah. which yeah. you can't live off. And yeah. name it for what, what it is, actually. Mm. And like, one of the things about Stonebow, which is that big British building, is that when we when I spoke to the um, uh, conservation team about that, they were basically just saying, um, oh, well, it's marginal economic space. Mm. So when we shift, in a way, those users out and get new users in, then just a new marginal economic space will open just more on the margins. So I think we're trying to name that for what it is, and try, I suppose argue that we need to have ways of life in the city which are affordable, that lots of different people can use the city centre for. Um, but it's, we're not really sure about this whole finishing thing no. as well. Because I suppose a bit like, Beni um, I'm not going to say the name of the hill right, but the Benicky project. It's like, it didn't, this, 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 mo this money from the HRC is just... It's, some stuff was happening before, wasn't it, with the Oxford Alternative History, and it will carry on happening afterwards, but it has catalysed a few things, particularly it's given me confidence, I've been an activist in Europe for a long time, it's given me confidence to go and knock on doors that I don't think I would have felt if I didn't, wasn't carrying HRC and University of Leeds a lot. And that funding made the plaques, we could actually do the yeah. plaques because yes. of that funding, which was the important bit, that wouldn't have happened without that. So. Yeah, so it's made some certain things possible, definitely, and we'll think more about that. Um, but yeah, just as a joke, like maybe some permanent plaques as well. But but that was that. It's something about that being um, not just a static to sort of use Karenza's phrase, not just a static legacy. Mm. Paul, you were sort of saying you sort of see that as being potentially sort of dynamic in its own right as well. Well, I, I, I can't see the difference between something that's permanent and temporary because they they turn, they, they swap places all the time, don't they? So mm. you know, at, at the end of the day, it's about people, about whose history is it, and what we pass on, and what's worth. With keeping, and what, what what you decide to keep today could be ditched tomorrow. But <laughs> seventy years time, it's back again. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's us. That's about us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys, and we're <coughs> we're pushed for time a bit. So, and, and that was a kind of conversation. So, rather than kind of opening it up onto the floor, I think, and putting pressure on the last. Um, <coughs> last talk, uh, if, if we kind of hold some